Revenue Chat Episode 62. Welcome to Revenue Chat, where I speak with the experts and provide you with actionable advice and insights. Get valuable takeaways for your rapid success at TonyDURSO.com slash takeaways. Author, speaker, mother, and advocate Rusty McDonald is a veteran in sales, marketing, and event coordination. After a messy divorce, she took to the airwaves and created Live and Thrive, a successful weekly radio talk show. In speaking engagements, she discusses a wide range of subjects such as domestic violence, poverty, and food allergies, to name a few. And her growing workshops inspire women from all over the country on how to deal with and cope through travesty. Rusty tells us about living and thriving next on Revenue Chat. Hi, everyone. This is Tony D'Urso with Revenue Chat. With us, we have Rusty McDonald, international talk radio show host of Live and Thrive, every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Successful in sales and marketing, she had to deal with a messy life circumstance, a bad divorce, which is enough to have some people throw in the towel. Rusty's response was to create a radio talk show and propelled herself to the top. She is now a successful multi-author, speaker, and runs a popular workshop for women teaching them on how they too can overcome adversities in life. Her website is RustyMcDonald.com. That's M-A-C, RustyMcDonald.com. All right, get ready for Rusty to tell us all about living and thriving. Let's bring her on. Hello, Rusty. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for having me today. How are you, Tony? Oh, I'm great, and thank you, and I am grateful to have you on the show. Your bio is amazing. All the people you've helped since you were four years old, it's truly a great story, and I really, truly hope that my audience and everyone, in addition to my audience, goes to your site and checks out what you've done, because you, you're a true humanitarian, if I can say it that way. Thank you very much. My pleasure, and thank you again for taking the time to hang out with us on Revenue Chat and your busy schedule. I'm excited. I've actually been looking forward to this. We booked this a while ago, so I'm glad I didn't miss it. (laughs) Well, good, good, good. Now, Rusty, I mentioned just a little bit about you, not very much in the intro, and perhaps you'd like to fill us in a little more on your roots, how you became an expert in your field and so on. Rusty, how did it all start for you? Um, I think the universe has got a lot of jokes, and I happen to be the end of it. Uh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh no. So, so in the beginning of my time on this planet, it's always been one adverse adversity situation after another, after another, after another. You know, I've, I've been abused. I've been raped. I've been shot at. I've lived on the streets. I've been homeless. I've lived oh in severe poverty. Goodness. I've had cancer. I've lost two children due to miscarriage, and so it's just been one thing after another. A horrible marriage, abusive relationship. When I decided that the marriage was not working for me anymore, I had to sit back and figure out why. And that's really when I started coaching, and that's really when I started exploring what it means to be human, what it means to be who I am, and what what am I, um, and what it means to really exist on this planet, and, and what I want to do with the rest of my life. Wow. For someone that's so upbeat, no one would think that you have been in such adverse conditions. It's truly something. You have a very strong life force in you, Rusty. Thank you. I, I, you know, and again, I think you come to a place in your life where you figure out that you have a purpose. And I still don't know exactly what that purpose is, but all the lessons that have been handed to me by force (laughs) have really made me determined to reach out to other people and say, I'm not perfect in any shape or form, but I am human and this is what I experienced and this is what I've gone through and this is what I'm doing about it. And hopefully that inspires other people and motivates other people to kind of wipe up off their knees and move forward because it's really your only choice. I like that. I like that a lot. And, you know, I've been in some extremely bad, adverse situations growing up. Nothing short of a nightmare. I don't talk about it, but it's prompted me to write a book, which I'm hoping to release at some point on dealing with such things. So you and I have a lot of common in that because on the surface, and I don't mean superficially, but just, you know, people that talk to us would never realize the trouble and the issues we've been in. It's quite something. 
Well, and I think it's delightful that we're so human, that we're, we're human enough to assume that if there's a scar, it's visible. My scars are not visible. They're internal. They're on the inside. And I do have external scars, but that's from, you know, crashing my BMX into a tree or, you know, getting hit by a car because I was playing chicken in the street, which is stupid. I don't advise any kids to do that. (laughs) You know, I was a kid. Um, And back then, organic parenting was the norm. (laughs) You know, you got up, you ate your cereal and you went outside. The door was locked and you were outside until your middle name was called or it was dark. (laughs) Uh, you stayed out until you, for me. Oh, yeah. You stayed out until you were called for dinner. That was it. That's right. And the parents didn't ask where you were, what you did. They nope. could care less if you were twenty miles away. It didn't matter. Just That's be right. home for dinner. That's right. So and different now, today. Now, now we begrudgingly call that organic parenting, and we're taking kids away. And I'm just going, "Are you kidding me?" Right? Now? <laughs> Is that what it's called, Rusty? That's what they, organic. Yeah, they're parenting? calling it organic parenting. I'm like, no, that's normal. That's the way you were raised. <laughs> wow. So anyway, that's a different show within itself. But Yeah, it is. And speaking of show, you have a popular radio show, which is now, as I, I understand it correctly, is now on twice a week due to popular demand, which is very cool. And it's called Live and Thrive. Exactly. It's Living and Thriving with Rusty, Inspiration on Tap. And what I do for my community service is invite people who have gone through or are going through something that is of mind, body, or soul. And in that, I've had rabbis, I've had shamans, I've had priests, I've had cancer survivors, I've had parents who lost their children through really major tragedies, I've had drug addicts, recovering drug addicts, you know, just this myriad of life stuff. And what's been beautiful and delightful about hosting this show is it has nothing to do with me. I'm just a messenger. I'm just the person who connects the audience with amazing people who have amazing stories. And they're not being endorsed. They don't make any money telling their story. It's nothing fanciful like that. It's genuine, everyday people with genuine stories to share and hopefully in some way, shape, or form, it inspires other people to do better. I like that. Very cool. And as you mentioned just earlier in this interview, you weren't sure maybe what your purpose was. Well, I think that's it right there because you just said it's so so nice right there. You're there to help get other people's stories out, help get the information that's needed, get that basically help others. And I think that's probably what your test is. If That's what it seems like to me. And I agree. I think, you know, it's real fun when I get to meet people and they're like, oh, you know, you don't understand my plight. And I just kind of sit back. and I'm like, okay, tell me your plight. And then they Google me or they go to my website or they listen to one of the radio shows or interviews or some of the TV shows that I've been on. And they're like, oh, my God, I never knew. You know, I don't carry the I don't carry the burdens that I walk through. And that's what makes it different for me to relate to other people is because I don't wallow in it. I wrote a book, Having Tea with My Skeletons, and it's my life story. You know, the real ugly parts and the real beautiful parts. But one of the things that I've lovingly coined is a place called the Emotional Quagmire. (laughs) And that's the place that's like our Linus blanket. And it's just this place where all of your fears and all of your desires and all of your hurt and every, every single emotion that we have as a human live. And sometimes we water the weeds that strangle us in the end. For me, as I was writing the book and I was sitting down with each and every one of my skeletons in my closet, (laughs) I started cutting those weeds back and I stopped watering them. Wow. So, and I still have skeletons to go through. I'm at the end of the day, I'm still human and I still have things that I have to work on. That's an everyday process, but it's different than dragging through the slush and the, the swampy sadness. I kind of surf along now. I'm just like, okay, I'm human. I'm flawed. I'm deliciously, delightful, beautifully flawed. (laughs) And I'm okay with that. And when you get to that place, you're you're lighter as a person. And I think you're able to help more people. But because I don't wallow in that misery, people are often shocked. Like, really? (laughs) Yeah, really. That really happened. (laughs) I like that. It's like a self-cleansing process, if I could label it so that way. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's a very cathartic, it's very cathartic to sit there and strip all your clothes off in the middle of New York City and say, this is me. Even though I'm being metaphorical, I haven't done that yet. 
<laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. It might be a marketing ploy in the future. Uh, but metaphorically speaking, that's really what it is. It's opening up all of the dark places, all the, the places that have hurt for many years and saying, okay, this happened to me and I have to be okay with it. I have to face it. And it takes a lot of bravery to do so. There was another B word I was thinking of, but I'm not sure your audience. So, <laughs> Well, it takes cojones, okay? Cojones. Cojones. Ah, ah, ah. Thank you for correcting. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. It does. It takes strength and bravery and yeah. courage to say, I did this, not necessarily looking at everything all at once, because I don't even think that's possible, and that would just crash somebody. But one by one, taking some instances that one did not do well, confronting them, being responsible for them. I think that that's part of the process of why we're here, is to straighten out ourselves. Well, and I think if we were, if I think if the intention for us to be on this planet was to have this perfect existence where everything was hunky-dory and we had everything that we needed and we didn't experience the emotions, you know, we'd be a wrinkle in time. We wouldn't be, and it's a book if you don't know, we wouldn't be this delightfully comical creation that the universe made. We have all of these emotions to experience them and we have the intellect to make an understanding as to what those emotions are. So we make that choice. I mean, free will is free will, and it's delightful. However, <laughs> I think we underestimate the powers that we have innately for self-healing and acknowledging the experience that we have and not really turning it into the end of our world or our existence on the planet by it's self-sabotaging, so, you know? Yeah. Am I being clear? <laughs> yes, yes. I, I understand it on several levels. I, I, yeah. I truly do. I do want to say that because of the nature of some of our past actions that maybe we're not proud of, some of our skeletons, it's a little bit tough sometimes to look at it, notice it. It's tough to accept it. It's tough to even recognize it. And I think that's where um, coaches and something like that is very helpful. I believe you do some workshops or you do some coaching because it's helpful to have someone else. People have a mentor for business, but this is like for the person. It's very important sometimes to have someone help give some oversight and so forth. For men, it's their wife. That's a joke. <laughs> but not everyone is so fortunate to have a spouse or someone that can help them in a positive way as opposed to finding faults in a negative way. I'm talking about the, ne the positive aspect of this, coming to grips with some of our shortcomings. Well, and I wouldn't even, I, and honestly, just from what I have experienced, and I, and I can only speak to my experience, but my feelings are, the negative is good. <laughs> it's how you choose to react to that negative. It's how you choose to hold on to it, acknowledge it, accept it, or let it go. And I think it's absolutely important to have as many positive influences in your life. But I can tell you from experience, it's not going to happen today. It's going to happen when you're, you're open and willing to see it. So we tend to busy our lives with work and driving fast and going to the grocery store and soccer games and da -da 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 you know, we're like this fast food species now and we stopped acknowledging our own personal strength, powers and passions. And in that we have neglected what it means to be human. <laughs> we watch reality TV shows to feel a little bit of something. People are making money off of that. So instead of sitting back and saying, okay, I acknowledge that this tree is beautiful. I acknowledge that there's a spider crawling across my windshield. What is it doing? Just having that sense of wonderment and that sense of desire to look for the positive, we've neglected because we fill our lives up with so much stuff that we worry and con we're concerned. So I don't think you'll just get it from your wife or husband or whatever. I think you have to outwardly seek it. Yes, I do agree because you can get someone who's more exterior and external to the scenario. Right. And, and help get through it. And yes, we are talking about negative, something negative in our life, skeletons, as you probably call it. And yep. we need that pointed out. But I kind of tweaking my point as I go along, better stating it, actually. We want it in a positive way. For example, I once had a brand new custom built home on a golf course. Brand new. Uh -huh. I was associated with someone who was very negative. Nothing was right. The grounds weren't right. The paint wasn't right. The this wasn't right. The that wasn't right. On and on and on. It got to the point where 
I could no longer stand to live in that house. I had to get out. I let it go. I walked away. Yep. So there's there, negative is good, but it's got to be put in a point of, in a positive way to improve, as opposed to just, I'm better than you, you're bad, you're always going to be bad, or whatever the underlying current is. Well, that's, just, that's is, just narcissism. That's not even, that's not even, you know, again, negative. If you didn't get into a car accident, you wouldn't be more cautious about driving. If you didn't fall off your bike, you wouldn't be more careful not, you know, to have your shoelaces tied. <laughs> so for every negative, it's how you react to that negative. And some people, they fall off their bike the first time, skin their knees. They're like, I'm never touching a bike again. It's horrible, blah, blah, blah. And they never ride a bike again. That's Does that really the way happen? It. Yeah. I've because actually met kids who just will never touch a bike again because they've fallen off and they've skinned their knees and it hurts and they're terrified of it. Really? But it's the way you perceive it, the way you react to it, and how you handle it. And if you're well-equipped with handling things, you'll get back on the bike the next day or maybe even in an hour. But if you're not and it takes you longer to learn or you need more influences, just be open to that for sure. Good points, good points. When I was growing up and you skinned your knees, you may not ride that bike that day, but next day, what skin, what knee? You're back on it, just riding like crazy. <laughs> yeah, no, I grew up in the South, and if you skinned your knees, you know, it, <laughs> growing up in the, <laughs> when I grew up, you cried if you wanted something to cry about. And if you cried too much, you'd get whooped, so you stopped crying. That's just the mentality, it's just the way it was, not judging. I'm used to that. <laughs> so, you know, skinning your knees, you just bite your teeth, you get back up because you got to be brave because it's embarrassing not to be brave and get back up and do it again. Not everybody has that stubborn goat-like nature. <laughs> I don't necessarily recommend anybody being that stubborn, but, it, you know, it, well, I got through some things. <laughs> well, we are, we are truly a different society now. It's so, it was so different back then, Rusty. Now it's organic. <laughs> Well, and, you know, it still cracks me up because most of those people that are taking the children away from the quote unquote organic parents and these parents just let their kids do the same thing, actually less than what you and I did as kids. And the people that are actually trying to enforce these new organic parenting laws are the same kids that probably egged their neighbor's house when they were a kid. (laughs) They were probably the same natural organic children that we were. Yeah, back (laughs) then. Just cracks me up. It was just such a wild, uh, just, it was living life with much more abandon than today. Today's changed, though. I must tell you, I don't have children. I have a fantastic dog. I'm always happy with having dogs. It's just my lifestyle. And yeah. my, my wife loves it that way, and we're, we're great with it. So I don't know the all the issues, and I am not an expert on parenting today. I just know what it was like to be the, the kid of yesteryear. <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's so much to, I, I feel bad for the kids nowadays. I'm like, really? You're not allowed to do what? Oh, shoot, honey. We ruined it for you. <laughs> we were naughty, I guess. <laughs> we were, what's it called? The uh, the bad influence. <laughs> right, right. We broke all the rules. We write books of our childhood. People would just shake their heads and go, oh my, OMG. <laughs> exactly. WTF. <laughs> there, exactly. Now it's abbreviations. Right. So, um, so with your show, we were talking about your show. Was there anything more you wanted to mention about that? You bring on people of all sorts of walks of life and mentalities well, and they tell their and life I'm, story. And like you, I'm sure Tony, with your radio show, you get really literally all walks of life. And there's certain, there's certain things that just have no relation to what I'm trying to accomplish in this lifetime. So there are people that do not get an opportunity to be on the show and it's just because they're messaging or they're, it's not about healing. (laughs) You know, I love sports, absolutely big, huge soccer fan. Would love to talk about soccer all day long, but the show's not about sports. It's about mind, body, and soul and overcoming adversity. So, you know, I don't talk about sports on the show that way. I love cooking, but I'm not going to talk about a ginseng knife or a ginsu knife on the radio show. It really is about people taking adversity and making their lives better, mm-hmm. How, whatever shape that comes into. Um, and that's the beautiful part is exploring life through other people and seeing how people go through stuff and hearing the truth about the human issues. It's just it, it's eye opening when you go, oh, my God, I, I went through a lot of stuff, but Lord, <laughs> Thank you, universe, for skipping me on that one, you know? Um, exactly. 
And Rusty, my show is predominantly business people, entrepreneurs, right. solopreneurs, startups, people that are in sales, marketing, and there is an edge, and that edge is life. There's a periphery, you know, living well, dealing with adversity, which is why you are a great fit to be on the show, even though we're not talking business and cash and dollars every second while we're on this. There, This is part of life and part of being successful in life and doing well in life. Well, and as you know, you know, every successful individual out there on this planet has been fired, has failed, has had life handed to them in one way or another. And what they, they had no choice, but to either get up and move forward or just lie there and be a a blob. So it's perfect for business in regards to stamina and motivation and determination to better yourself. Exactly. We're going to be covering some of those topics in just a moment. But first, I wanted to mention that you are a multi-author, and I believe your last book, am I correct? It's Pride in Pride and Prejudice, A Relocation Nightmare? Correct. And that's a mother's journey of fighting for her daughter's rights. By the way, people can find out about your book and so forth. I mentioned it earlier on. Your site is RustyMacDonald.com. Can people find out about your books there? Yes, sir. Okay, good, 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 good. Tell us about your latest book, please. My latest book is my personal journey in regards to trying to relocate to better my daughter and my life um, and the antiquated value system that's still held in the family justice system. It's pretty dumbfounding when, as you read the testimonies and you read all of the facts in the case, you're, you're going to sit back and scratch your head going, how did this happen? This is 2016. All of our rights were taken away from us. We have been, I was discriminated against because I'm adopted. And I, I can't figure that one out either. Because I, I strongly believe that it was a gender issue. Uh, my daughter had a male guardian at litem. Her father is very angry and has <laughs> a lot of, uh, he has a very difficult time getting over the divorce after five years. And so he's going to, he fights me tooth and nail about everything. Which is what it is. Sorry to hear about that. That stinks. Well, you know, people are people, and he earned the right to be my ex-husband by his actions, just like I earned the right to be his ex-wife because of my actions. So that's the adult version. (laughs) But the courts are supposed to be there to assist you and to find a middle ground and, and to help support what is in the best interest of a child. And as you read our harrowing story... The readers will really understand that the the family justice system is really fraudulent in a lot of ways, and there's an apathy towards what's right and what's wrong. So it's it's a telltale story about my last four years. Hopefully, it'll change some laws. Hopefully, it'll shake up the system enough where people go, "Oh, that really happened. Ew, gross. Let's fix this. This shouldn't be happening." That backwoods mentality. So okay, I gotcha. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I hope uh, for those that like to read a good book, this is a real life story in Pride and Prejudice. That's cool. Not that the story is cool, but it's cool that you've confronted it, brought it up and and wrote about it to, you know, to fix things. Well, and I think one of the largest lessons that I've learned in this lifetime is you have to be a tree shaker. And you can sit there and you can get sand kicked in your face all day long if you don't get up and move and say, hey, stop kicking the sand in my face, you're going to continue to get sand kicked in your face. That's just basic logic for me. And in our situation with everything that we had gone through, and are still currently going through, by the way, if I don't raise my hand and say, hey, this is not right, and try to point out these issues, thousands of other families are going to go through the same thing because nothing's going to change. And I just, it's, I think that's why I go through what I go through is to just be a tree shaker. I like that. That's good. And as part of that, you also help other women in doing, in dealing with their scenarios also. I believe you have workshops for this, right? I do. Tell us I about do. that. I do. Uh, I was very fortunate to be the keynote speaker for One Billion Voices, which is an organization that's international that advocates, supports, and brings to the forefront domestic violence issues in, you know, internationally. It's a beautiful thing. Um, So from that, I spawned workshops in regards to how do you really cope? How do you deal? How do you figure out who you are, which is really the key in the start, you know, digging, digging down deep 
and reinvesting in yourself because when you're in an abusive situation, you lose a lot of yourself. You lose a lot of your confidence. You lose a lot of who you are, your dreams, your hopes, and a lot of fears start growing around those things. Um, so the workshop is really to help re-inspire somebody who's just kind of peeking into life going, okay, maybe I can do this again after my ordeal. I got you. Very cool. And do you travel the country or to travel the area or are these in a fixed location? How's that work? This summer, it's just the East Coast. Um, I'm hoping by fall and winter, I'm going to be more, more national. Um, it's hard to actually book speaking engagements. Uh, I'm a one man show, so to speak. So <laughs> between the radio show, I'm publishing 13 books by the end of the year. I already have six done. Oh my and being goodness. a full-time single mom, <laughs> you know, and working to pay the bills. It's, it's very, very ambitious what I'm doing. So definitely I, I'm still weeding through who I want to do this with, who's going to make the most sense. I think teen centers and domestic violence shelters are very huge and important. It's kind of the, the beginning phases of growing out of an abusive situation. High schools are incredible because a lot of the children that attend high schools, I know for myself, they're living in violent situations, especially now. You can't even turn on the TV without somebody blowing somebody else up. It's crazy. So those those are the kinds of places, but they take time to set up. So I'm hoping this time next year I'm going to be doing more of a national tour versus just one coast. I'm not complaining. I love it. It's very exhausting, but it's worth every every ounce of energy just to see these women rise up, even if they only rise up for a day. That's more than they've done in years. Okay. Rusty, while you were saying that, I have a couple of people that have come up which I'd like to speak with you off show that I'd like to introduce you to that may be able to help even if just a little bit. And we can go over that, but you have a great cause and I want to help you with that. And I'm going to introduce you to some people, but one thing that did come to mind. Thank you, Tony. Oh, my pleasure. And one thing that did come to mind that can help quite a lot. And I advise anybody in business, especially the solopreneur, the entrepreneur to start up. Get yourself a virtual assistant. They're not very costly. They're tremendously helpful in those things that need to be done. If you want more information of where to go, I, I know a couple places I'm happy to, to give you some referrals, but a virtual assistant may be able to take a big load off of you because I understand what it's like to do things all on your own. Totally know what that's like. Yeah, it's been, especially this last year, you know, writing a 300 page book takes, it's about 15 to 20 hours a week alone, just writing, editing, reconfiguring your thoughts, trying to tone down any temperament that you might have and being the redheaded stepchild. I got a temper. (laughs) I'm passionate about things. I don't think I have a temper, but I'm very passionate about things. And so people kind of, they don't understand how much work it goes into just writing a book on top of trying to maintain a household and a radio show and doing all of these events, which has been amazing. I I can't even tell you, Tony, how I don't know how my life blossomed the way it did because I didn't see it coming. I just saw me helping people in my own little way and it's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and, and I'm grateful and very humbled. It's pretty amazing how many people <laughs> um, are out there rooting for me. So that, that's awesome. Be glad to help. And I know yeah. what it's like to spend time writing a book. One of my yeah. <laughs> one of my books, I have a co-author. It's a fiction book. It's a series. There's yep. at least three or four books planned. It's called the series is called The Good, Bad, and Gold. The first book is called The Pursuit. It's about 500 pages, and that's after taking 300 pages out because it was just too fat. It took about about 10 years. But separate to that, I'm writing a a book for two, probably two, three years I've been writing it. It's over 500 pages now. It's called Sharpen Your Wits. And let me tell you, it's much more than sales and marketing. It's a bigger picture that will help but it's so much work and it takes so much time and it's like when one pours one's heart out into one of these and takes and slaves over for a long period of time you know when you see the end of finished product you have no idea the toil the love the labor that went into it 
So I totally understand what it's what you're going through to write to write books and get the message out. Well, and it's fun because somebody said to me the other day, they're like, "You have six published books. What you know, five published." And Pride and Prejudice should be coming out in about a week or so. I'm just waiting for the legal team to finish reviewing it. <laughs> They're like, you should be a multimillionaire. You shouldn't be broke. You shouldn't be going through all these struggles. And I just scratched my head. I said, the book's $17. I make 88 cents out of that. That's exactly. it. So if I can get 1,000 people, I get almost $1,000. If 25,000 want to pitch in, that's awesome. <laughs> you, you need you, Exactly. You need to sell a million of these things to, to, exactly. to, to warrant it to be your life. Otherwise, it becomes the sideline, the hobby. And I hate to say that word. It's not the right word. Your passion, because I'm saying that about me too. It's more than just a hobby. It's a passion. It's I want to get this information out. But there's no payment for it. <laughs> well, and, and as anybody in sales and marketing can tell you, you know, since 1814, the best marketing in the whole entire world for hundreds of years now has been word of mouth. How better can you get with branding yourself, branding your business by having a personalized story? Because that is word of mouth. And so, you know, tying in your sales sales side, that's how coaches and life coaches and speakers, motivational speakers do it. We have to give you as many pieces of us as we can, whether it's audiobooks, conferences, events, speaking engagements, book writing, webinars. It's a labor of love. I'm not going to say it's not, <laughs> but you know, to be successful in this particular industry, you have to have varying components of who you are and it has to be extremely personal or nobody's going to want to say, Hey, I'm going to open up and share my horrible story with you because you're just not trustworthy. So in a sales and marketing perspective, it's one of the hardest roles to encompass an authentic way of being in a very salesy world, if that makes sense. I understand. And speaking of that, as mentioned earlier, do we have any points or successful actions or takeaways for people that want to, of course, do well in business and in life and do both? What would you say would be some good successful points for that, please? I think as a as a businesswoman, as a mom, and as somebody who's traveled a very long road in life, the one thing that has gotten me as far as I have is my sheer determination. I'm really good at saying, okay, what do I have to lose? And sitting back and really weighing out what I'm going to lose in doing whatever it is that I'm going to do. Um, so writing this book, it's a very powerful piece. It's very politically incorrect because it's pointing out a lot of flaws in an entire state. <laughs> you know, So it's not going to make a lot of people happy, but it's going to open up a lot of eyes and hopefully it's going to change the laws. What do I have to lose in writing about domestic violence, nothing. At first, it was very scary. And at first, it was, I was living in shame. But in actuality, what I'm doing is allowing people to understand that it's okay that you've gone through this. Let's move forward. So as a business person, what do you have to lose is the first question you should ask yourself. Second question is, what do you have to gain? I am the queen of having lists. I have goal lists. I have journals with goals. I have, it's like Matt, they call me the Mad Hatter because I have all these books of things that I think about and just brainstorm. Okay, so here's point A, here's point Z. How do I get there? How do I build that bridge from where I am now to a place that is going to offer me what it is that I seek? So being very goal oriented and really working hard towards those goals should be the second thing that you do as a successful person. And the third thing is you're going to get your haters. Haters are going to hate, trust me, and appreciate them. Don't own it. And it's very hard because you're going to get people who, no matter what your industry is, you're going to have somebody who's going to challenge your resolve. And the good news is you can sit back after a while and say, huh, Thank you for challenging me. I appreciated that you poked me just enough and you got under my skin just enough where I had to make a choice of who I'm going to be. Thank you. And acknowledge that and be good and move on and still stay focused on your goals. Those are my top three. Good. It, the last one's a bit hard to do. Vital, but it's a bit hard to do for sure. We want, <laughs> we want everyone yeah. to like us, don't we? And it's just, it's sort of like 
we have all these people that like us, but our attention goes to that one person that said something mean or nasty or didn't like what we said. And it just kind of closes in our world or our universe because we want everyone to understand and appreciate what we're doing. <laughs> well, and, and as a Pollyanna as that is, and that's great, I, you know, I can tell you from experience that I would be the first one who would start crying if I got reprimanded because I was always in trouble as a kid, even when I didn't do anything. I could be asleep and I was in trouble. <laughs> Not kidding. I mean, I literally was always in trouble for something. You too. I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was our whole generation. But... Yeah. We would just but... be standing there. And next thing you know, we get beat. What? What right. happened? What happened? Like, shoot, and beat by your neighbor to your mama, and then she'd beat you into the house. It's like, what is going on? Um, I breathe. That's it. So I'm a very sensitive person, and in that, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've passed up a lot of opportunities. I have been extremely and totally and perfectly human in my life, and I had to sit back and say, why do I keep screwing up my life? which is really my thought. That's a human thought. It's a human experience. It's a human feeling. So I started journaling and brainstorming, going, okay, I'm screwing up my life. How am I screwing up my life? What do I have to lose by screwing up my life? Am I really screwing up my life? And being as rhetorical and as hard on me as I could to realize that I'm not screwing up my life. I'm just extremely sensitive, and I shouldn't be putting myself in situations that are going to challenge that. Oh, so the stock market is not a place for me. Okay, cool. <laughs> you know, let's acknowledge that. And, you know, we're good. And that's when I think that a person starts becoming successful because you can start acknowledging your deliciously flawed self and accepting those flaws instead of being afraid of them or trying to deny them or trying to hide them because it's not helping. It's not working. I like that. I like that. I'm getting lost in what you're saying in, in a way. No, no. <laughs> I mean it in a positive way. I zone into things and I just get like whisked away into yep. it. So I'm like, oh, wait, we're talking. We're on the radio. Because <laughs> it's like what you're saying I, it's so cool. Very cool. All right. We touched upon earlier in the show, very, very, very beginning. I mentioned it once or twice. We talked about our purpose here, what we're doing. You're being tested. Rusty, I like to talk about purpose at this point in our show. What do you want to change in the world? What drives you to keep on, please? I'm not really quite completely sure other than I think I'm borderline insane at this point. <laughs> I think for me, it's, I feel very much like a mother hen. And I feel like every time I'm able to share my story, I'm just herding the little duckies back to the safe place. I don't know how to explain it better than that. It, it's one of those things where if people hear that they are human and they hear that they're flawed and it's okay to be human and okay to be flawed and it's okay to be a walking hypocrite because we all are, that's a human experience, then we let go of that power of fear. And when we let go of the power of fear, we can start walking in our authentic way, our authentic self. We are surrounded and bombarded with people who ignorantly say things to drum up fear, to put gasoline on that fear fire. And it's eroding in our society. It's eroding in our education. It's eroding our culture. And the more people who get pulled away from that fire and say, whoop, slow down. <laughs> Let's think about this logically and understand who you are. And that, that fear fire is not, it, there's no purpose to it. My hopes is that there will be more people who are compassionate, more people who are empathetic, and more pe people who are authentic to spread that and maybe, you know, put the fear fire out. I don't know. Maybe that's an over overzealous ambition, but, you know, I just turned 40 and I've gone through hell and back. I think that's what I'm supposed to be doing for the rest of my life. That's very profound. You know, fear is probably the only thing that someone or an institution or any entity can put over someone to subjugate them, to make them do what they want. Fear is that one factor, because without fear, we'd be very different people. Think about it. I mean, we body shame all the time. We racially shame. We religiously shame. We sexually shame. We gender shame. We even shame on the color of someone's hair. You know, growing up as a redhead, I'm with the name of Rusty, Lord, trust me. We have constantly, as a society, embraced and encouraged this shaming, fear, not good enough, 
thing. Whatever that thing is, wherever that, that fear fire was developed, it's grown profusely and to the point where people are blowing each other up over what? I mean, there really is no purpose other than to spread more fear and to spread more control and to make people more quiet about who they are. And for thousands of years, we've done this. We've seen it. We've watched it. We keep feeding that fuel. So maybe with hope, there'll be more people who just turn their backs and say, yep, nope, I'm good. I have nothing to do with it. I don't know. Well, it's very tough because I think it seems to be the appearance is, is that it's in our culture, in our television, in our, in our books, in so much of what we do is this, this fear. And that's because we're putting gasoline on the fire and the television and the books and people's actions and even sales models. If you were to look at some of the old school sales models, they were ridiculously almost impossible to achieve. You know, the 1% could achieve some of these sales models, but you were made to feel like a piece of dirt if you could not make a $30,000 goal on a Tupperware. Yep. And yeah. that kind of controlling brow beating mentality has been with us for a few thousand years. And has it worked for us? What have we gained? <laughs> a very fearful society. We're af afraid to go out where uh, some people are. I don't mean all. Uh, af have to lock your door. Because you don't want someone to come in, have to yeah. lock your windows at night, uh, lock your car, uh, afraid to leave things out in the open. Sometimes I knew some people, I mean, so the fear is runs deep so many ways. I knew someone who had a new car and was afraid to tell her coworkers of what she had done because then she thought that they would look at her differently. She was afraid of their response and reaction, thinking that she's rich or something when it's just it's just a new car. Doesn't mean you're rich. <laughs> right. And that's and that's what we've done as a society is we've challenged the very scope of what it means to be human. We've challenged the very scope of what it means to be emotionally intellectual. We're no longer allowed to have that ability to make a decision without feeling some form of shame or fear over that decision. Some sort of ridicule is going to come from somewhere. And like I said earlier, haters are going to hate. And when you get to that place where you are living a more positive life where you're inviting more positive people in your life and more people that are authentically themselves, you'll have the haters in the background, not in the foreground. And that's the goal for any business person, any person on this planet, I think. Yeah, keep them to a minimum and don't keep them up front. You want your good, positive people around you. <laughs> that's right. That's it. You, you keep your cheerleaders close and you keep your haters at the distance and you're good. Uh, the, good. More you, the more you don't acknowledge them and the less that you react to them, their power goes away. So if you don't feed the fire, it's going to die out. That's you just so got to have the patience and the time to watch it die out. And you got to have the charisma to say, hey. Thank you so much for challenging me today. Now I really know who I am. Thank you. And really acknowledge it for what it is. And it's just an experience and a test to see if you really are who you say you are. It's so true, Rusty. And when you, you know, when anyone thinks about it, what power does that person or entity have over you? If you, not that you ignore it and pretend it doesn't happen as in the case of, you know, a near violent situation and you're surrounded by people or whatever, but in just some social media or communication or whatever, it's like, eh, don't give it the credence. Don't. And that the, removes the power from that person because the only power they have is your fear. Well, and you know, even taking it a step even more simple, almost everybody knows the story about the nagging mother-in-law where you never do anything right for the mother-in-law. You're never good enough for her son. Never, never, never. Naggy, 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 naggy. You have two choices. You can either try to create a new person within yourself that's going to placate this nagging mother-in-law who you're never going to be good enough for, or you can just say, hey, thank you so much for challenging me. I appreciate it, but I am who I am. And eventually that mother-in-law is going to be like, huh, because they have no power to nag you anymore because you're cool with not doing the whites the way they want you to do the white. That's just a very good. generic sample, but... That's what we need to be better at instead of placating and really delving into these quote unquote reality TV shows and, and getting fearful about the newspapers. We're the consumers. If we stop buying the newspaper because we don't want to read any more about hate, what's going to happen? They're going to have to change their stories to something that we can handle or want, right? Absolutely. That advice is worth 
minimum a million dollars. That is super Wait. powerful. Super. Don't powerful. forget when you write the check out, it's I E, not Y. <laughs> 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 With an M A C McDonald. That's it, exactly. <laughs> That's I don't powerful. have golden arches. <laughs> <laughs> powerful advice, Rusty. I love it. I love it. And as provocative and stimulating and exciting and everything else, the show is coming close. We're close to wrapping up. Is there anything else that you would like our audience to know about? Anything else you'd like to tell people, please? My other advice would be really seek out and reach out to people. Don't be shy. Not everybody bites. There are a lot of good people still left in this world. If we can all gather gather around and really acknowledge the good people, and, and that'll grow better, a better community. You know, don't be afraid to reach out. If you have questions, you can reach out to me on Facebook. You can reach out to me on the many applications. I'm always available to try to help guide you just like i know you are tony and and anybody else who's listening it takes a village to raise one child imagine what it takes to raise an adult (laughs) so we all need to just step it up a little bit and and acknowledge who we are and reach out and and make those necessary changes just have a better future don't forget to read my books they're very inspiring i'm so grateful to be on your show well thank you rusty it's been a pleasure been fun i love it i always learn something in here i've learned some very good points and some good points additional good points have been accentuated so thank you very much for that thank you for sharing all this lovely information with our audience i hope they put it to good use and let's see your website is rusty that's r-u-s-t-i-e M-A-C-D-O-N-A-L-D dot com. I hope everyone goes to it, checks out what you have. Uh, You and I will separately talk about anything else we can do. And that was great. Thank you, Rusty, again. And thank you, everyone. And stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. Listen to my other awesome interviews at Tony, D-U-R-S-O dot com slash radio. And please drop me a message. I'd love to hear from you. All right. Thanks again, everyone, and until next time, remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely.